We're gonna stay on this topic uh, about uh, parenting a little bit. Um, I, think in, I think in our modern times, sometimes we're just trying to get through something that God has told us to be intentional about. You do realize just getting through something and being intentional about is two dra dramatically different things. Um, like, like you can just get through it by the skin of your teeth and, and, it, and it not turn out great. Not the same as if you are really intentional. And so I know in a, in a church this size with, um, we have a very wide ranging age demographic here. Uh, I was thinking just a second ago, man, it's a really good season of a church to be baptizing people and dedicating babies. Isn't that cool? Uh, and that's not lost on me. I know that some of you are past the age of child, your, parents, your kids are already adults, I, I know that. But let me say this, it's never too late to be intentional about your life. It's never too late to be intentional about your life. It's never too late to be intentional about your family. It's never too late to be intentional about your kids. It's never too late to be intentional about your grandkids or your great grandkids. It's never too late. It's, it's what God calls grace. That, that he allows you at whatever stage of your life to come to him. Now, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, but at whatever stage of your life to come to him and go, hey, I need your help on this. I wanna start being intentional. And the grace of God allows you to do that. Amen? So we're gonna read uh, from Deuteronomy. We're gonna back, go back to the Old Testament where they used to beat kids. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter six. The reason this is important, it's the end of Moses' life. And he's trying to ensure that the people that he led out of Egypt through the power of God make it as a people. He's trying to ensure he's not going into the promised land with them. He's, he's standing outside. He knows his life is coming to an end. And Deuteronomy is him wrapping the whole thing up going, hey, hey, don't screw this up. Now, now we know they do. But this is a man who's trying to ensure that everything that God had passed down to them about the way to live and the way to handle each other and the way to handle other people, that they remember. He says, it's all riding on this. So we're gonna read Deuteronomy chapter six, verses one through nine. If you wouldn't mind staying to your feet in honor of the word, we like to do that here. It says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statues and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. God, we pray, we pray, we pray that you give us the strength as parents to pass down who you are not just who you are, but how to know you and how to live blessed, not, not simply how to get things, Lord, but how to be obedient. We pray that that be a sign of healthy families in this overall family, that we raise obedient children, not just to us, but to you. Thank you for giving us, entrusting us with, with the responsibility to do it. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, 
Amen. You may be seated. It's true that the Israelites were standing on the precipice of going into the promised land. They would cross the Jordan River under the uh, leadership of Joshua after Moses dies. And they would go in and conquer the land uh, and they would live there, but it wouldn't, it really wouldn't last that long when you think about it. When you think about a chosen people who had God himself, the creator of the universe on their side, the miraculous way they would take over the land, they would defeat Jericho, they would go into all those cities and he would do miraculous things, getting them out of Egypt after being in slavery for so many years. He would do so many miraculous things and they would vacillate between complaining and disobedience and obedience and complaining and disobedience and obedience. And, and soon they would get kicked out of the land that they were given. At this point in time, Moses is old and he is not going into the promised land. Some of that reason is because he was disobedient and he gets to see get a glimpse of it, but he doesn't get to go in. So he's giving them a rundown. The whole book of Deuteronomy is him going, hey, I need you to pay attention here. This is not a joke. God has called us to be obedient. And if you do what he asks you to do, your life will be blessed. You have a long life. He will protect you from your, I mean, it's, it's a list of unbelievable things that God promises if there's obedience to what he's asked them to do. And so as a, as a father of the nation, as the, as the leader, as the guy that's bring, brought them out of Egypt and brought them this far, there's a responsibility he feels for passing it down. Like you have to pay attention and teach this stuff to your kids. You, you have to, you, you, can't, you can't just let them figure it out. You've got to teach. And so Moses is doubling down over and over and over again. And something that is not popular today, we'll start out with, is that he tells them to fear God. And I know popular teaching tells us that God is warm and fuzzy and, and um, you know, you don't have to fear God. You know, you know, he's your buddy, little baby Jesus. But I, I need to break something to you a little bit. And this may be shocking uh, to your senses. You should be afraid of God at times. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you read the book of Job, Job uh, in, is a man that says was upright and more righteous than anybody around. He was, he was unbelievable in his obedience to God. And Job gets sick. And, and there's a little thing at the beginning of Job where in our modern day sensibilities, we don't understand what's going on. And maybe when you get to heaven, your eyes will be enlightened to why it happened to Job and all that stuff, or maybe why you even struggled with certain things. But right now, it, it kind of messes with us a little bit when we read the book of Job. But when you get to the end of it, one thing doesn't mess with us. Job questioned God at the end of it. And God went, all right, buddy, stand up. I've got a few questions for you. And at the end of Job's conversation with God, at the end of the book of Job, Job goes, yeah, I made a mistake. Now, now listen, this is a guy who lost his whole family, got sick, boils, scraping them off with broken pottery, laying in the, laying in ashes and his buddies come around and say, well, it's all your fault, Job, if you hadn't sinned and they're, and they're just miserable people. You don't want support like that, do you? And so all his friends come around and make him feel like a jerk and he wishes he hadn't been bored. And then he gets to the end and he realizes in all of that, all of that suffering, all of that, I probably shouldn't have questioned God. There was a reverence that Job understood all of a sudden because God was standing in front of him. He could hear him, he could talk to him. He was, he was being questioned by God and God was saying, hey, I, I just wanna be clear. Were you around when I put the stars up there? Were you around when I did this? Were you around when I did this? Were you around, could you do any of that? And over and over, Job would have to go, well, I, I was busy that day. He, he, he realized what his position was with God and he realized that he had overstated his position. Now, 
let me make a differentiation here. You can't overstate faith, but you can overstate, you can overstate your own confidence. And more and more and more, as our culture moves away for God, from God, we feel more comfortable questioning him. You don't have to say amen, Berkeley Springs is making up for you right now. <laughs> we feel more confident questioning God the farther we get away from. The truth is the closer you get to God, the less questions you have. I had a conversation with somebody a couple weeks ago where they were saying, hey, when you get to heaven, what do you think, da 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 I said, I don't think you'll be asking questions. I don't think, do you really think you're gonna get in front of the God of the universe where everywhere in the Old Testament, he shows up, people fall on their face and you're gonna get in front of him when you get to heaven, you're gonna go, hey buddy, I've been waiting on this. I got a list and you're gonna sit down and answer them. That ain't the way it works. Job realized he's, he's not somebody to trifle with. Matter of fact, at the end of Job, Job he says, I, I misspoke. Job evidently was a politician. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was saying back then. I didn't understand what I was doing. I just, uh, you know, I just got carried away. Here I am. And he realized I have no basis. The, f the thing that Moses is telling people is you should fear God first. Now, now let me, I know this doesn't make sense in 2024 because we're like, oh, well, you've, he's a meanie if you gotta fear him. No, it's a reference because he's the creator of the universe. It's a reverence because his understanding is beyond your ability to even comprehend. It's a reverence because he set it all in motion, all in place. He breathed life into man. We believe in the creation story that God spoke things into existence that weren't there before. God is omniscient, all powerful. He's omnipresent. He's everything all the time. There is nothing beyond his grasp or capability. And yet humanity stands in confrontation with God going, prove it to me. And what Moses is saying is the first thing you need to teach your kids is God's not somebody to trifle with. He's not your next door neighbor. He's not your dad. He's not your, like, I'm just gonna play a trick on dad. He's God. So let me ask you this. Who do I obey more, the creator of the universe or the buddy? And so, so what you have to understand, listen, I grew up with the pendulum swinging all the way the other way. Now we're like, God's warm and fuzzy. He's your buddy. Do whatever you want. He'll forgive you. He just likes hanging out. I grew up, you're going to hell no matter what. And God can't wait to send you. Right? So now we're like, nobody's going to hell. God's warm and fuzzy. Back when I grew up, it was like, you better. I'm like, I cussed on Thursday. I'm like, it's over. I might as well give up. Not going to make it. But God is someone to be feared and someone to be delivered by at the same time. But parents, listen, we do a disservice to our children if we don't teach them to fear and love God. We do a disservice. I remember, I remember, I remember we would have political conversations in our household around the dinner table. We would, because the kids would come home from school and they'd say something and I'd be like, well, you know what the truth is. But I remember saying this, we're gonna respect, we're, we're gonna respect the president no matter what because of their position. Amen? Well, remember that back in the 80s? Remember when the culture used to be like that? Well, let's just respect people because of their position because if you don't respect the position, then all of a sudden it's chaos. Amen? And so what we're teaching our kids now is God's position of creator isn't something worth fearing. It's not something worth respecting. And Moses says, listen, this is part, this is part of the deal. Remember Moses was the one that was called up to the burning mountain. So Moses, 
Moses is saying, all of you people stood down at the base of the mountain and didn't come up with me. I was the one that was up there when it was on fire and the clouds and the smoke and the craziness. I was the one God was talking to. God has talked to me in the Holy of Holies in the tent. Every time we moved, I'd be in the tent. Moses knew what it was like to be in the presence of God and it made him shudder. He didn't get confident like, God, you're not gonna do. No, in the presence of God, he realized how little he was and how big God was. So when he tells them something you need to pass on to your children is the fear of the Lord, is the reverence of God. God is not, some, not somebody to be played with. He's not your buddy. He's not, he's not a hangout friend. He's God. Amen? Now, we can fear God and love him at the same time. Some of you, some of you adults remember, that's what you used to do with your dad, right? There was a side of him where you're like, I've never seen it and I don't want to see it. And so you have to understand, God is truth and grace. Jesus came with truth and grace. And I know our culture right now does not believe in judgment, but God will judge. Amen? And I know Tupac didn't get judged by anybody, but God will judge him. Trust me. I just told everybody what era I grew up in. <laughs> this is important because our culture is moving farther and farther and farther away. And Moses says, Deuteronomy 6, 2, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. He said there was a, there was a connection between a, a fear and reverence of God and doing what he asked you to do. Amen? Now, can I give you a little parenting advice? If you're trying to be your kid's buddy, they're never gonna listen to you because I don't listen to my buddies. Amen? They may say what they want to me, but then I'm gonna do what I want. I, I would listen to my dad because I knew there would be judgment afterwards. Yeah. Okay, Chris, go do what you want. But guaranteed, when you get home, there will be a time of judgment. <laughs> yeah. So Moses is telling them, listen, we, there needs to be this reverence for God because your, the blessing in your life depends on obedience. Oh, we're going to get into that in a second. Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, with all your might. So these two things are going together, fear and love. He's saying you should have a reverence for God and a love for God. So I wrote this down, a house without fear never repents and a house without love never trusts. A house without fear never repents. If, you, if we don't teach our children to fear God, why would they repent of their sins? Why am I gonna confess my sin? If I can lie and get away with it. If there's, no, if, there's no, if there's no ramifications, why would I do that? Repentance and obedience are the cornerstone of blessing. Now, I know we also live in a culture that says, do whatever you want to, it'll turn out fine. Can I just open your minds up to something? That is not true. It's not true. You can do whatever you want to, but then it's gonna turn out however it turns out. The truth is still, if we do it God's way, our life is blessed. That is still a truth. If you do it God's way, your life is blessed. Say amen again. Amen. I, didn't make, I need to make sure you understand that. If you do it God's way, your life is blessed. Now. I know in modern day times, we'd like to sprinkle in. So we do a 50% God's way and 50% our way. That's like playing blackjack. And you're taking a hit with 18. I don't know how I know that, but um, <laughs> like I'll just do some of mine and I'll do some of his and I'll do, it'll work out in the end. No, it won't. No, blessing is linked to obedience. And so I can look at the level of your obedience and I can also look at the level of your blessing. Amen? 
And it was like that in my house. I remember our oldest daughter said to me one time, uh, it, was a, it was shocking to me because I thought we were, I thought we were pretty disciplined parents. I didn't think we were freewheelers. Um, and so what happened was she, we were sitting in the kitchen one time, she was maybe a senior in high school and, and she said, man, my, uh, my friend's parents are really strict. And I'm panicking because I'm a pastor. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, do you think we're strict? And she went, no. I was like, where were you last weekend anyway? <laughs> I, and then I responded with this. You've never given me a reason not to trust you. If you were to do that, it would look a lot different. It would look a lot different. What we tried to instill in them was that when you're obedient, blessing comes with it. When you're obedient to God's word, blessing comes with it. When you're obedient to God's word, blessing comes with it. When you're obedient to God's word, blessing comes with it. When you do it the way God wants you to do it, blessing comes with it. You know what's the problem with 99% of our culture now? We're trying to do it our way and still live a blessed life. And you can't, you can't get the relational entanglement of the way we're raising kids and the way we're doing marriage today. We had long conversations about this a month ago. The way we're, the way we're talking about roles in families, the way we're talking about children, the way we're, the way we're dealing with this whole scenario does not, does not command the blessing of God. We're doing it the opposite of what he says and then we're wondering why the whole thing's screwed up. We're wondering why 45% of families, 45% of children are being raised with no fathers in the home and why those kids are turning out vastly different than kids with fathers in the home. We talked about that two months ago. The reason is because when you do it the way God says do it, there's a blessing that comes with it. Amen? He says, look, this is the way I set it up. If you do it the way I set it up, it works. So we need to teach our children, when you're obedient, there's a blessing. Look at your neighbor. When you're obedient, there's a blessing, tell them. Look at your kid. When you do what I say. Now, where does this start? Children should have a keen sense that their parents have a respect and reverence for the power of God. Where are they gonna get it from? It's not enough to drag them kicking and screaming to the church on Sunday morning and have me tell them. On Wednesday, when you tell them, do as I say, not as I do, that doesn't teach them to fear the Lord. That teaches them to do whatever they want. So parents, listen to me. They have to see this in you first. And what Moses was confident was they had the, the children of Israel had seen that in him. Listen, I'm proof to you that when you obey God, he blesses you. It's the right thing to do. It's the best life for you when you obey God. So as parents, what we do is we say, hey, listen, I'm gonna tell you up front, I'm not gonna get it all right, but your dad is gonna try as hard as he can to do it God's way. And when I don't do it God's way, you'll find out. And I'll be honest with you, but we're gonna try to do it God's way. No exceptions. I'm not going to make any excuses. I'm not going to make any side rules for me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do something when you're not around. I'm going to try to do it the way God wants us to do it. They have to see that in you. you have to be an example. Moses is saying, teach this to your son and your son's sons. So he writes in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four and five. It's actually Jews later on called it, it's called Shema. It like summed up all of the law. It's called the heart of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love him with everything you have. Moses says, fear the Lord and love him. And in verse four and five of chapter six, Moses kind of sums this whole thing up. And then it's carried on through the rest of the Bible. Matter of fact, Matthew, Jesus quotes the Shema. Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 through 39. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, 
figures. <laughs> Asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? So they all knew it. They all knew this Shema thing. You shall, and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So this idea of fearing the Lord and loving him with everything that you have carries all the way back and all the way to us. So when reverence and love are combined, it produces a desire to obey. Amen? It produces a desire. And so when, when as parents, when we, when we cultivate the culture in our house, we can't be all love and no fear and we can't be all fear and no love. The thing, both of those things together, we have reverence for God. We have reverence for God and we love him with everything that we have. We show that through worship and we show that through generosity and we show that through helping others and we show it through, through being kind and gracious and forgiving, all those things. And we create, can create a culture in our house where both things exist. And when both things exist, then we develop a culture where we desire to obey God. And that is a long gone idea, isn't it? The Bible's just a bunch of rules that don't make any sense, that don't help. Why do I have to get married before I get in a relationship, intimate relationship? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to? It's so old. Why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? If, if God wrote that, it's so long ago, it doesn't make any sense. Why, 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 why didn't it make sense? And it's really hard to obey somebody that you don't have reverence for and that you don't love. Okay. It works the same way with kid to parent. Do you hear that? It works the same way from child to parent. So as it works from us to God, if we don't have reverence and love for God, we won't obey. Guess what? If we don't create a culture where our kids can have reverence and love for us, they won't obey. So the whole thing is, is can I, can I live a life that my kids would revere? Where my yes is yes and my no is no. Where, where I'm not vacillating, where I'm not, where I'm not doing this and then they find out, where I'm not, where I'm consistent, where I'm, where, where I'm, caring where, as much as I can be, I'll be honest. All those things, and then I'm loving on top of it, which creates a scenario where they want to obey us. Somebody said, if you put that in a pill, I'll give it to them every day. <laughs> now, I know some of you, Beth and I say this all the time, we did have docile kids. And we thank God for that. My, our kids weren't perfect, um, but they were docile. But, I, but I'll tell you this, here is, looking back on it now, I think there were some things we did that helped our kids be docile. We, if you can believe it or not, are docile people in our house. Now, outside of the house, I'm a hard charger. I want to grrr, get it done, get it done, get it done. And a little bit of that came in. But my wife and I weren't yelling and screaming at each other all the time. Right? No. <laughs> we actually made a commitment early on in our marriage, early on in our marriage, that we would not do that. We said it out loud. That we would not be yelling and screaming in the house. We actually even gave each other permission because I've told you before, I have one emotion and it ain't happiness. We actually gave each other permission. If we were overreacting to the scenario, the other spouse could look at the other one and say, hey, maybe you need five minutes to calm down. And we did it. We did it all through our kids growing up. My wife would look at me and say, hey, you need to take five minutes. Do you think I like that? No, but I respect her enough to be able to see into me, to be able to say, hey, we made an agreement not to be nut jobs in front of the kids because we want them to be docile kids. So if we're never docile, how do they turn out not 
how do they turn out docile? So we have to cultivate the culture inside the house first. So we had to, as God treats us, when we revere and love him, he blesses us, but he's created the culture by which we could do that because he's perfect. So in our imperfection, how do we do that? We had to give each other permission. My wife is as godly as you can get. <laughs> You'll never catch me saying something different. <laughs> She's as godly as you can get, so I respect her enough to look into me and say, hey, you're overacting. She did the same to me. And there were times where I'd say, hey, you might need to take five minutes. And what did we do? We created a culture in the house where we weren't flipping out and it helped our kids not to flip out. Amen? And so in that type of culture, it's easier to be obedient. It's easier to be obedient. And I know some of you are like, I'll give you my kid for five days and we'll see what kind of culture you do. <laughs> this is not simply a Sunday thing. Listen to me, parents. You can't do whatever you want Monday through Saturday, bring your kids to church on Sunday, dump them off in the kid's wing, and then say, I hope you got enough Jesus to listen to me the rest of the week. It doesn't work. It does not work. The church isn't your net for being irresponsible. The church isn't your safety net for not creating a culture that your kids can love and fear God. The church isn't the fix-all. The church is a place where we come together and reinforce, I'm praying to God what you're teaching them Monday through Saturday. The church is a place where we can get together and say, hey man, I'm having trouble with Billy and it looks like you're having trouble with Susie. Can we get our heads together and figure out how to fix these two kids? Amen? The church is a place where we can get help. When Beth and I first got married, we were in a connect group with all people who were old enough to be our parents. It was, a, it was a married couples connect group. And we'd go there, we'd just start having kids. We'd be like, I don't know, they had already raised kids. And they were able to come around us and say, you're gonna be fine. You know, they were godly people. They were giving us advice and it helped. That was because we were in a family. We weren't coming to church, dumping our kids off and going, well, I pray something works. They were giving us, giving us information on how to create that culture in our family. And that's what Moses is doing. It's not simply a Sunday thing. Deuteronomy chapter six, six through nine. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them, what's that word? Diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Look at your neighbor and say, every now and then we're gonna have to sit down. <laughs> now, just so you know, I'm not a pastor that's going to go down the travel sports thing. Our kids play travel sports. But you better figure out a time to sit down at dinner every now and then and create culture with your kids. Sometimes we were traveling, sitting down at dinner. I'm not, I'm not the guy that's going to stand up and go, you're going to hell if you put your kid in travel baseball. You're, come on. That ship has sailed. You were going to hell 10 years ago if you put your kid in travel baseball. We're over it now. <laughs> no, but in the midst of that, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I'm going to say this. This is when people asked us back then, like, how do you let your daughter play soccer on Sunday? I would say, I hope I hope her relationship with God transcends Sunday morning. That's what I would tell them. We're raising her in a way that her relationship with God will transcend Sunday morning because I know that there could be, an, there could be times in all of our kids' lives that Sunday morning is not an option for them to worship. There could be those times. And that same daughter when she was in college, ended up going to Cardiff University in Wales and, and, and picked a church on her own, not because I called her and pressured her, and she played travel soccer all the way growing up. 
And so I wanted her relationship with God to transcend Sunday morning. So if I said, oh, you can't ever miss a Sunday morning, you're going to hell. What does that make sense? No, it transcends Sunday morning because on Wednesday, you're sitting down having a dinner talking about the goodness of God. And your relationship with God doesn't rise and fall on how often you attend. Now, I think you should be here every week. I don't know why I pointed to you. <laughs> he is here every week. Unless he's not. Um, but do you understand what I'm saying? When you make your ch your your family's relationship with God always dependent on Sunday morning, and that's the only time you talk about it, then it's not a culture. It's like going to get ice cream. Moses is saying, you make it part of everything that you do. Write it on your doorpost. When you sit down in the house, talk about it. When you're walking along during the day, talk about it. When you're with your kids, when you're with your sons and your daughters, you talk about it. You hang it on your body. You, the law is our, is our pathway to blessing and we can't let it go. So we weren't perfect at it. But my wife was amazing saying, hey, we're gonna have dinner at the house. We're gonna have dinner at home tonight. She'd fix a great meal and we'd sit down. And you know what, inevitably it would come up. Hey, how's your day going? How's, what's going on? What's going on, da, da, da. And the kids would bring something up and then I would get on my soapbox for the next three hours and they'd roll their eyes at me. True, where's Emma? True. And they would roll their eyes at me, but guess what? We were creating culture. We were creating culture. I know you don't wanna hear dad talk right now. None of you wanna read Leviticus either. I know you don't wanna hear dad talk right now, but we're creating culture. And so now that my kids are older, they're calling me back now going, hey, like I was here and I heard this, this seems off to me, I don't know. What do you think? It's just, I don't know, I don't know if that's biblical. Now they're older and those dinners that we had were important because they, they were the way we passed it down, the way we passed it down. And you might say, Chris, I'm so busy, you better figure out how to do it at Chick-fil-A. There's a lot of Jesus in there, so you can go ahead and have that talk. Um, you better figure out how to do it at Cracker Barrel. You better figure out how to do it on the way to somewhere in the car. Instead of yelling at your kids about poking at each other, why don't you start creating culture in your family? Why don't you start preparing a conversation? Why don't you start saying, hey, we haven't talked about this. Why don't I bring it up? Turn the radio off and have a conversation with your children. Be diligent about teaching them. And if you don't know how, Find somebody that does. You're in a church family. Look at somebody whose kids turned out and say, you have to help me. <laughs> it shall be in your heart. Parents were to embrace God as the center of their lives, not an addition, not an add-on. When the parents lived out their calling in obedience to God as their creator and protector, the blessing, of the, the blessing of the family then went on to the kids. It depended on it. So do it on your way. Turn the radio off. Bring up a conversation. Ask your kids how they're doing. Link it back. They're passing stuff out in the kids' ministry. There's plenty of resources. You don't, have to be, you don't have to know the whole Bible to figure this out. Start a conversation. What do your conversations consist of on the way? You know, at some point in time, we have to make room for our children to communicate what they're dealing with. And let me tell you this, your kids are dealing with more than you ever have. There was no internet when I was growing up. There wasn't 24 seven pressure to be a certain way. When you went home, nobody called you. I never called my buddies because I didn't want to talk to their dad. I'm not calling your house, your dad's gonna pick up. That's weird. I'm gonna like drag the phone into your room. You got 75 feet of cord in the kitchen. We didn't do that. We lived in a trailer. We were too poor to have a cordless phone. <laughs> we just, trailer was 75 feet. We had a 70 foot cord in the thing. 
drag it all the way to the back. Morning and evening, pray at the beginning and end of the day with your kids. Beth and I weren't perfect at this. We wanted to pray for them a lot of time before they went out to go to school. We wanted them to know that we were praying God's protection over them. When they got older, we would text them and say, hey, we're praying for you today. We wanted to pray with them before they went to bed. We wanted to make sure when they shut their eyes. Listen to me, parents, as little, when your kids are little and they're afraid there's a, there's a boogeyman under the bed, tell them that God is enough. Pray the protection of God. Let them know that God is their protector because there'll be a day when dad can't stand in the room with them. Create the culture. This is absolutely the key to blessing in your family. And what Moses was handing down was not a momentary blessing. It was a generational blessing. Teach them your son and your son's son. Keep teaching, keep passing it down, keep passing it down, keep passing it down. And the problem with our culture, which much, much the same as the Israelites, they failed to pass it down at some time. And if you look around the United States, we have, we have failed miserably at passing down a fear and reverence of God and a love for Him and that obedience is a pathway to blessing. Be diligent about it. Now I'm going to end with this. Stand to your feet. When you get to Jesus' time, Moses says this to Deuteronomy 6. He says, hang it as frontlets on your forehead. Now I'm going to just let you know that's a little, I don't want you walking around with the Bible like hanging on your forehead. What happened from that point in time all the way up to Jesus was people got really good at looking holy. Really good at looking holy. And when Jesus came along, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law and scribes and all the important people, and they were perfect at looking holy, but horrible at being holy. In Matthew chapter 23, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you to do but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes on their robes long. So we go all the way back to Moses when he says, write these on your clothes and hang them all over the place. Don't forget the law, don't forget how to do it. Don't forget, don't forget. They were doing all the external things that made them look holy. Verse six, and they loved the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. So let me tell you the culture killer in your house right now. The number one culture killer in your house is when you walk out and come to church on Sunday morning and your kids see you act holy and then on Wednesday they see the real you. No, that was tough. No amens on that one. Jesus said the teachers of the law and the Pharisees that in his day, that's exactly what they were doing. They loved to be called rabbi by the people. They loved to pray. They loved to show it off. They loved to have these robes and all the stuff hanging on them because they're keeping the tradition of Moses. But they weren't keeping the most important part to have fear and reverence and love for God, which resulted in obedience. So Jesus says, listen to what they say, but don't dare do what they do. Because when they got their robes on, they look just fine. They look holy, they look perfect. But when they go behind closed doors, they're not the people you think they are. So the quickest way to mess your kids up is if you come to church and you go, oh man, this is amazing. And then Monday when they see you come home from work, it's a different person. It's a different person. You don't have to be perfect, but you do need to be consistent, amen? You don't have to be perfect, but you need to be consistent. And if, you need, if they need to see you consistently ask for forgiveness, then do it. But do not act holy in one spot and not in the other. Your kids will pick it up. Moses said, don't do that. This is not just an external thing. This is a heart thing that we're teaching them. 
And what you're doing, parents, is you're creating an environment in your homes where your kids can be blessed for generations, where they can be blessed for not a moment, but generations. And I don't care who's running for president, this is how you fix a country. This is how you fix a country. When the church determines that we will be obedient to God and we will raise our kids in obedience to God, this is how you fix a culture, amen? Can I pray that over you this morning? Lord, we pray by the power of your word and the Holy Spirit that you'd enable us as parents, as grandparents, as great-grandparents, Lord, to live a life that creates an environment where our children learn to obey you.